Hey, guys. So they brought the shrink in again. I guess you guys are still dysfunctional around here. <laughs> How many of you brought that dysfunctional person with you today? There you go. That's good. A little intervention. You know, I always bring you a psychologist joke, and I forgot to do it, but I did remember one. Um, you know how many psychologists it takes to change a light bulb? Anybody? Everybody's heard the one, you know, but the light bulb has to want to change. But I have a better one. No, it only takes one, but it's going to take 12 sessions. So, <laughs> All right, so that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today is this, this process of how we get better. I'm going to start with a question. And, and this isn't like um, just a throwaway question. It's a real one because I want you to think about it. Um, how many of you have ever had a period of time in your life that's significantly long enough where you felt like, I wish this part of me or this part of my life were getting better and it's not? How many of you can relate to that? And the rest of you are liars. <laughs> I mean, we all can, right? That's kind of universal. Everybody's experienced that. But I do want you to kind of tune into that and ask, what about right now? Is there some area that I kind of feel stuck in? You know, the world that psychologists deal in, it's like a pie. And I think it's also the world that the scriptures talk about. There's this pie of life, and it's got three big slices. One is our clinical, this clinical slice of life, how we feel. How are you doing? Are you thriving? Or, or, and that's where depression or stress or anxiety or addictions and all that stuff sort of lives there. And the second piece of the pie are our relationships. And the third piece is our performance. And so somewhere in that pie is either maybe fears or anxieties or moods or addictions or relational thing that's not going well or maybe it's in in your career or the performance pie of life I think we all can relate to that in a, some sort of way because I want you to be aware of that area that kind of feels stuck a little bit because something else the Bible says and I can promise you this is true it says hope deferred makes the heart sick and it's when we're crying out to God, we want something to change, and we're stuck in some area. God, why, why can't you change my career, or why can't you do this, or why? And we're kind of like stuck, but our heart gets sick. And that's what I want to address this morning, because a lot of times time can go by where there's no change. But I also think the scriptures in my experience in life as a clinician, and also um, my own life, is... <clears throat> that God also will intervene into that time at some point and begin to bring change, but it generally looks the same way that's talked about throughout the scriptures. And today we're going to talk about that path, what it looks like. So we're going to hop into a parable that Jesus told that I think talks about this very directly. And it's out of Luke 13. Let me read it to you. Uh, here we go. And then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but he didn't find any. So he said to the man to take care of, who takes care of the vine, who took care of the vineyard for three years. Now let's hit pause. That's what I'm talking about, that area of ourselves that we want to get better. And we examine ourselves, we go, for three years I've been stuck in this. And I'm not getting any better. And I'm trying. I'm planted somewhere doing something. I mean, he's getting, you know, probably fed and watered. But I'm not changing. And our heart starts to kind of grow despondent. But it's worse than that. Look what it says. It says, for three years I've been coming looking for fruit on this tree. And I haven't found any. Cut it down! Exclamation point. It's an angry statement. Cut it down. Why does it even use up the soil? It's worthless, basically. And the story goes on. Thankfully, it doesn't stop there. And he says, sir, the man replied, the vineyard grower, to the owner, he says, sir, leave it alone 
for one more year and let me dig around it and fertilize it. And then if it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then you can cut it down. I believe in this parable are contained the dynamics that we see that are the ingredients of change that we see throughout the gospel and the Bible. And anything a psychologist ever did that was worthwhile. And we're going to unpack that. Um, you know, there were enough of them in my life, periods like this, where, you know, I was trying to think, you know, maybe I'll share one of those. And, and I thought, um, well, here was a big one. When I, was, um, when I was a kid, I was in the seventh grade, and I stood up to give an oral book report one day in front of the class. We had to give a book report. And I started in it, and somehow, I don't know what it was, my notes or something, somehow I got flustered, and then I got nervous, and then I got anxious, and I couldn't, and then I started stammering and stuttering, I couldn't find my way, and literally, I, I kind of had a meltdown, and I couldn't finish. I had a teacher, and I still remember her very well, she stood up, and she said, you know what? You will never amount to anything in life if you can't speak in front of people. She said, you were talking about maybe one day wanting to be a lawyer. Well, obviously, I got over that. But she said, you know, <clears throat> she said, you'll never be a lawyer without learning how to speak in front of people. You better find something else to do. And she told me to sit down. And literally, it's a pretty shaming experience. From that point on... I would not get up and talk in front of people. I mean, literally, it wasn't even a wooden, I couldn't. The thought of it, I would become so paralyzed that I just avoided it throughout high school. In fact, I almost didn't graduate my senior year. I had been recruited to play golf in college at a top 10 golf school, and I almost didn't graduate. I was, I was, just said, flunk me. I'm not doing my oral book report that the senior English teacher wanted me to do. And she let me come in and do it after class. That's how bad it was. So I went through college. I never would speak in front of people. And then I went into practice, and I was working with companies and people and organizations and building models. And they'd always, will you come speak? No, I don't do that. Will you come speak at our church? No, I don't do that. And I literally never would do it. So one day, I'm at the gym working out. I mean, I know it's hard to believe, but, <laughs> and this, this, I, I'm, I finished my workout, I'm walking to the showers, and this big naked guy walks up to me, <laughs> serious, and he was huge, I mean, tall, it's like, <laughs> really tall, sorry, um, <laughs> didn't sound good, and the reason, he, pray, he played for the Rams, but he walks up to me, didn't know me from Adam. He says, are you a Christian? I said, yeah. He said, God just told me to tell you something. I'm going like, well, I'm also a psychologist. I can make those voices go away. <laughs> Need a little help. He said, no, I'm serious. He said, I'm a pastor. And I said, where? And he told me. So, uh, you know, it's the Newport Vineyard. I, I used to live in Newport Beach. And I said, well, that's kind of legit. And I said, okay. So we went and sat down, had coffee next door. And <clears throat> he said, look, here's what happened. I saw you and God said these words. Ever since you were a child, because something, a kid, because something bad happened to you, you've been afraid to speak in front of people and you've avoided it. And the Lord says that he is calling you to begin to speak for him. And he's gonna open some doors and he wants you to walk through them. I don't know what the theological term for this is, but I knew at that moment I am screwed. <laughs> I had no choice. Well, <laughs> here we are. Hi, guys. <laughs> he healed me. But you know what? He didn't heal me 
at that moment, he had to heal me through a process. And I can't tell you how many times at the thought of wanting to do something or whatever in all those years, I felt so many of those cut me down. Why do we even use up the soil? I can't even talk to people. So the first thing we see about this process, and I want to deal with this first, the very first thing is there is this universal thing that let's call it bad time. Number one, bad time is a period of time where there's no change. So I want you to think about it. Maybe it won't come to mind right now, but if there's something in your life that this period, there's time going by, the tree was planted, three years is enough for several harvests of figs, and this relationship isn't changing, or this other part of my life's not changing, or whatever it is, it could be an addiction that's not changing. My career's not changing. I've been stuck in it. First thing I want to do is I want to normalize this. This is the story of humanity and every individual and the story that the Bible says, that we were once slaves in Egypt and we have all have and have those things. So let's normalize it. We spend a lot of money trying to act like we don't. You can surgery it away or you can Instagram it away, but the reality is nobody's perfect. But some of that imperfection can hurt. So let's just say this morning, what area is it? It may be a little pain, maybe a big pain, but what area it is, is it in my life that's not changing in my trying to change it? Okay, so that's the first thing we see. What happens next in the story? Anybody? What? Cut it down. Thank you. Now, I really want you to get in touch with this point because this is universal also. You know, every system that's ever studied human behavior has discovered that whether you're Christian, Jewish, Buddhist, Muslim, secular, whatever. It's like a friend of mine had a Christmas party and one year, and he got grief at his company for having a Christmas party. He said, all right, this year, we're going to have something for everybody. We got a Christmas tree over there, and we got a Buddha over there, and we got something for the Muslims back there, and that corner's empty for the atheists, if you want to go back there. <laughs> but no matter what faith you are, as C.S. Lewis said, we are all born with a sense of oughtness that's built into the universe that everybody has this feeling and some faiths fill it up with different rules and the way I ought to be and I ought to do this and I ought to do that. The, the, the blanks get filled in, but we all have this sense of things ought to be a certain way and I ought to be a certain way or you ought to be a certain way. And as Lewis said, if people say that they're tolerant and they don't put oughts on other people, go punch them in the nose and see if they still believe that <laughs> because it's built into us. But it's worse than that. The Bible says we're under this judgment. As Gare shared a few weeks back, the story of the Bible was when we fell, we're all under this judgment and it's built into our very wiring. You've never felt a a grace-filled baby. You've never seen one. All of you ladies that had babies, they popped out and they didn't go say, you know, they didn't say, Gosh, sorry, Mom, was that hard on you? Let me kind of, you know. It's not what they said. They judged you. (laughs) You're all bad. (laughs) They're wet. They're hungry. You're failing them. (laughs) Sort of looks like a lot of marriages, actually. (laughs) Judging. But we do it. We do it. This is built into us. So I want you to get in touch right now because this is, if you notice, this is this problem. If you notice throughout the scriptures, 
a lot of Christians think this is, this is the Christian life. And a lot of non-Christians think this is Christianity. Here's how I ought to be. I ought to have fruit. I ought to be holy. I ought to be good. And I'm not, so I'm guilty. And so then I walk the aisle and I repent and I confess. And I go into a little phone booth that's made out of wood and confess or whatever it is, but I confess. And then I'm going to go try harder to meet the standard next week. A lot of sermons work like that. You go to any church, not any church, but the kooky ones. Seriously, you drive across the country today, you'll hear three sermon, or a three-point outline in many churches. God's good, you're bad, try harder. That's the program. And that's a lot of people's change program as well. And they think that's the faith. And it's sad. That's the law. That's what Moses did. And the Bible says that's useless. Paul called it powerless and useless and basically worthless to change anybody. And it's never going to change you. If you have this goal, I'm going to meet this goal. I'm going to try harder. We get caught in that cycle that Paul says in Romans 7. The good that I would do, I don't do. I do the very thing I said I wasn't going to do. Again. And I feel bad. And I feel guilty cut me down. You go to get a performance review and your boss gives you five things that are doing great and says, but I got, really, got, a really, got a real problem with your performance in this area. And then you go home at night, you can't sleep. Why? Because you're thinking about the five things he's happy about or she's happy about? No. You're obsessing about the one. The negative. And there's a neurological basis for that that the fall experienced and that is neurologically, biochemically, psychologically, Research shows it takes five to seven positive comments for us to chemically be able to metabolize one negative one in the brain. That's how powerful this fall was and this powerful, the judgment is that we live under inside of our own heads and with each other. I've worked with a lot of high performance athletes and they get into performance problems, I can't tell you how much of it is a loop inside their head. You know, if a golfer's ready to hit that shot and he's thinking, what if I hit it in the lake? Ah! Then the brain stops working because they're afraid of making a mistake. Or NBA free throw shooter because that fear of failure, that badness, fear of rejection keeps us stuck. That's how powerful it is. Fortunately, the story doesn't end there. What happens next? Cut me down. I'm such an idiot. By the way, you don't really need anybody else to do this. You can do it in your car by yourself. <laughs> you know, we start examining ourselves and we just start to feel bad. Right? Please understand something. That is part of the human condition. Everybody that's ever studied human behavior does it. Immanuel Kant said we had this moral imperative. The CBT people who are the kind of psychologists that seem to rule the world now for a reason I cannot understand. But they say it's, all, it's only, only your critical thinking is causing all of your problems. Yes, that's kind of true. It's more than that, but it's very true that how we think negatively about ourselves does, is studied and talked about all the time. It's not just people of faith. But it's also deeper than the CBT. It's not just our thinking. Sometimes our negative thoughts come from deep feeling states and shame states and trauma states of I am bad. They get internalized because of things that happen to us. But fortunately, the story doesn't end there. Now that I've really depressed you, it does get better. <laughs> what happens next? Anybody? Louder? Okay. A lot of people are saying, that, yeah, you're going to dig around a fertilizer. Please understand this. Yes, that's coming. But it's not, please hear this. Please hear this. It's not what happens next. What happens next in the story? Number three. Enter the advocate. The vineyard grower steps into this circle of failure between the judge 
<clears throat> and the failing fig tree. Cut it down. You're so bad. I'm trying. No. You're worthless. Somebody from the outside steps in. That's the advocate. Who is that in our faith? Did anybody say Jesus? That's good. Yeah, it's better than my daughter Lucy, who first time, you know, she went to <laughs> her first Christmas pageant <laughs> in her church. She was like four years old, three years old. She comes back and I said, Luce, how was it? She goes, oh, daddy, it was great. I said, who was there? And she goes, well, it was Mary and Joseph and the wise men and the camels. And what's that baby's name? <laughs> I said, we are changing churches, I promise you. <laughs> yeah, our advocate is Jesus. Now, let me ask you a really important question here. What did Jesus say when he entered the picture. He didn't immediately start telling the fig tree, well, you got to get on a better diet. You got to exercise. You got to study harder. You got to, you know, learn how to commit. No, he didn't start anything that was life change in terms of their improving first. He started the only thing Please hear this. The only thing that can make life change possible, and that is when the judgment goes away. When the condemnation, when the shame goes away for being how we are. And he deals with that first. He says, wait to the judge. So the judge hits the gavel and condemns us. And that's the gavel we feel every time we fail. A lot of times somebody will just stay stuck there. But see, what the Bible says is that we have an advocate. Now, what's interesting about this that we don't realize is that that's what he does first. When Paul in Romans 7 is going, the good that I would do, I don't do. I do the very evil that I would hate. And who's going to stop me? And I said I wasn't going to, you know, use heroin again or use porn again or scream at my kids again. But I do it anyway. And I said I wasn't going to do it. And we walk the aisle and we, we feel so bad. And we say, God, I promise I'll say to your spouse, I'll never do it again. And then we do it again. So when he's in this cycle in Romans 7, he's talking about this, which is universal to mankind. The next thing he says is exactly what the parable says. He doesn't say, well, stop doing it. It's like that old Bob Newhart. Y'all got to Google that. Go, go, to, go to YouTube and look up Bob Newhart. Stop it. Okay, if you've never seen it. It's nothing like that. What does Paul say? Who's going to set me free from this? The next verse in Romans 8, 1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Once we reach out and say, Jesus, please help me, forgive me, be my Lord, boom, the judge is gone. Crucified, dead and buried, that law. He said, die to that law, Paul did. And Jesus said, I didn't come into your life to judge you. I came to seek and to save that which you've lost. How many people see our faith as a bunch of rules and trying to get better and failing and then feeling bad and then repenting from feeling bad because they feel bad and then trying it all over again. Please hear this. The Bible says that he is perfecting. In the book of Hebrews, it says, he is perfecting. He is going to make you better. Henry, you can't stand in front of groups. He will make you able to. He is perfecting. Then the next part of the verse says, those he's already made perfect. That's the gospel. That you are already forgiven. There is no condemnation. And see, that's the difference between a lot of, you know, like you see a lot of, you know, rigid, black and white, legalistic churches. Which, thank God for this place. <laughs> We're just all happy, 
driving, miserable, screwed up people. So that's good. I mean, you can, you, can be, you can be all messy here and we're happy about it. All right. But it's a lot of those churches, you know, that with their, they're real judgmental and stuff. And they always talk about the truth and you got to live in the truth. And they're usually named grace, but they talk about the truth a lot. <laughs> Seriously, I'm not kidding. It's like this. And to be a member there, you got to be holy. You, you know, you got to look good and you got to say all the right things. And they have a membership requirement of how you got to look holy. Well, it's interesting. You go over here to like a good, you know, somebody's been walking the path over here, repenting and not feeling holy and, you know, confessing and feel bad. And then they do it again and do it again and, and just can't pull it off. And finally, somebody who understands that cycle says, dude, that ain't going to work. Come with me. And they take him to a real, biblically-based recovery group. And they got a membership requirement in this group, too. You got to be screwed up to be here. <laughs> you walk in a recovery meeting, and you're still stuck, right, when you go the first time, or you go to a therapist, or you go to some other kind of group because you need help. You, and what do they do? You're feeling bad and ashamed of the bender that you just put on last night. And somebody says, come to my group. And you walk in and you feel shamed and bad. And you say, your name, hi, I'm Henry, and I'm here to, you know, whatever, whatever a holic you might be. And they say, hi, Henry. And you get smiles back. The condemnation is gone. Now, you might still be an addict, which you are that first night, but you're accepted in your failure, and no one will get better until they are accepted in their failure, and that is the first nail in the coffin of an addiction. Now, here's the last thing I want to say about this, number three, and that is this advocate, and please hear this too. This advocate who steps in to break the guilt and begin to help. We know the advocate is Jesus. But when Jesus walked into a room, who walks in the room? Who is he? When Jesus walked into a room, who is that? Anybody? I'm going to put y'all back with Lucy if you don't know the answer to this. Who is Jesus? God, thank you. Whew, good job, Gary. He's God. And when Jesus walks into our life, God walked into our life. But who else is he? When Jesus walked into a room, who else walked in? In Jesus. Just in that one person. Who? What? Father was up there. Holy Spirit was yet to come. Jesus walked in, you got God and man. See, we have an incarnational gospel. Carne, meat. God put on human flesh. And whenever Jesus walked into somebody's life through the power of the Holy Spirit that he would call down and the authority of God whom he saw doing all this stuff, he was also a human. And then he says this to his disciples. I'm going to leave. And it's better that I do. How can it be better that Jesus leave? He said, because then the Holy Spirit will come. And then as you see, he starts to flesh that out. And he will live in each one of you. See, Jesus used to be confined to a physical space of one body. Now, Jesus lives in this body. And he says, wherever two of you are gathered or more, I am there in your midst. So what I found out and what so many times people find out is this advocate, we have got to find the grace of God 
with skin on. Because that's how he says he delivers it. 1 Peter 4.10 says this, when you use your gifts with one another, when that NFL football player walked up to me in the locker room, God entered my life, but he used a gift that he put in a person, the spirit living in him. And then when I had to go sit down with a shrink, he starts to dig around and get to the trauma inside of me that produced that fear. And the support I got and the encouragement. I remember the first time I stepped out and tried to do it. I spoke to a little gathering of pastors. And I had to have God bless her for this. You could be this to other people. A friend of mine, a woman who came and sat on the front row and she said, I'll come with you and I'll pray you through it. And I gave a talk to her. Thank you. I appreciate that. She's going, what? (laughs) I'm kidding. But she was there. She supported me and other people did. And it was a, it wasn't a quick path. I mean, it didn't take forever, but it was some work to work through that fear. But it took Jesus with skin on. That is the church. That is this body And a lot of times people are saying, I can't feel God's grace. I know he forgives me, but I can't feel it. Well, they're only trying to get it in words and verses. And that's true. We need to get it there. But that system of the brain in language is a different system of the brain that the limbic system, the feeling system is hooked up to, which comes through experience and relationship. And when people are, when I read about God accepts me, he doesn't condemn me, but I've got my group and I tell them about my failure and they don't condemn me and they love me and they accept me, things break inside because that trauma and the guilt and the experience of shame, if we put a brain scan up to you, we can see it begin as somebody weeps with those who weep, as the Bible says do, and brings what's in the darkness into the light. We can even see the brain light up that starts to process stuff through that side of the brain over to the other side and these different systems, not quite as black and white as that, but that's the movement we get in the different systems and the whole person begins to get healed. As Jesus said, you'll know the truth and the truth shall set you free. But you never hear people quote the verse before and it says, if you hold to my teachings, then you shall know the truth and the truth shall set me free. And we just can't memorize the truth without experiencing. That word know is the Greek word that means the same idea of experiential knowledge. Abraham knew Sarah, which means he he slept with her. Know is the Bible's word for sex. A lot of people think it's N-O. No, it's (laughs) K-N-O-W. I knew someone in the biblical sense. You've heard that phrase. It's the full experience of another human being. And God wants the full experience of his grace in your life. And that only comes as first, finally get to the verse, 1 Peter 4.10 says this, when we use those gifts with each other, weeping with each other as we weep and supporting and processing and becoming the mother to the child and your best friend that they never had or the father or the brother or the sister or the healing agent or a good shrink will do this or a recovery group or wherever you find it. First Peter 4.10 says, when we use those gifts, and here's what it says, you are administering the grace of God in its various forms. When you mentor someone, that is the grace of God giving the plant fertilizer what it can't produce on its own I couldn't get over the fear on my own I needed fertilizer coming in from other people we need coaching, we need teaching, we need feedback we need correction, we need support, we need healing there's 
I don't know how many one another's in the New Testament that God does this, but how does he do it? He does it through digging and fertilizing. We got to find out what's underneath this fear. What's underneath this conflict a marriage is having? You can't just give them the law and say, be nice to each other. There is no way to say, I hate you with good communication. <laughs> you got contempt living inside of you in the root system. Where did that come from? We got to dig around and we need to be healed. Jesus didn't come to, to make us look good on the outside. The Pharisees did that. He came to heal us from the inside. The good stuff will come out as we're healed. I was, how many of you were at the singles group we did at Focus, were you? Let's see. I might have told this story then for forgetting. That's why there's not many, because the rest of them got married. They did what I told them. <laughs> yeah, you know, I was talking about this um, earlier. Somebody said, you know, when you talk about that singles um, thing, some people feel like you're, you were supposed to say they ought, ought to go get married. Some of them don't want to. I said, it's awesome. I don't think everybody ought to get married. Think of all the conflict you'll save yourself from. No, I, I'm not trying to put, but there are a lot of people who want to. But they feel stuck. You know, hope deferred makes their heart sick. And they, I'm trying this and it's not working. And it's a great illustration of what we're talking about for some people. I was doing a, <clears throat> an event one time in Cincinnati. I remember it well. And the seminar team was there. We're having dinner. And there's this young woman. She was 30-ish, 32, something like that. And we were talking about the event and all that. She said, well, I never thought I'd be producing events. You know, I never thought I'd be doing what I'm doing now at this point in my life. And I said, really, what did she think? She said, well, I always thought I'd be married and have kids by now. But God hasn't chosen that for me. And my ear kind of perked up because we had worked on a lot of events together and I knew her. And she said, God hasn't chosen that for me. And I'm thinking, it might be the guys that aren't choosing it because I know you. She wasn't easy to deal with sometimes. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean God hasn't chosen this for you? She said, well, that's what God does. You know, he brings the man you're supposed to marry to you or the woman you're supposed to marry to you. God will bring it to you. And he hasn't brought that person to me. I said, well, how do you know he hadn't brought 10 of them and you can't even recognize a good one? Or how do you know you haven't chased 10 of them off with your mm, issues? <laughs> she goes, no, that's what God does. He brings the man to you that you're supposed to marry. I said, you remind me of this woman that called in a radio show one time. And she said, I can't believe you're talking about dating. That's unbiblical. I go, what? She goes, that's not the, dating is not in the Bible. God brings the person that you're supposed to marry. That's what God does. He brought Eve to Adam. I said, lady, you want to do it the biblical way? Go have a war and capture a bunch of them. Pick whichever one you want. <laughs> There's so many different stories in the Bible about how, I mean, get, look at Ray, go hire somebody, you know, to go find them for you. That's what, was it Rachel? Was, yeah, Jacob. Anyway, there's 80,000. There's so much stuff in the church that's not in the Bible. God, please heal people that have ever been churched and not Bibled, <laughs> but they got churched in the name of the Bible that's not the Bible, and I pray that he heals you from that. But, well, this is a, and I can tell you, vintage, vintage is a good place to have that happen too. But I, I, I said to her, what do you mean God's, I said, don't you have any responsibility in this? And she goes, well, God's going to bring, I said, but do you have, the lady on the radio, she says, well, I, I believe the Lord. I said, do you have to go outside? Do you have to have to do anything to find your mate? She goes, I believe the Lord could just bring him to my front door. I have that much faith. And I said, well, if you don't want to marry the FedEx guy <laughs> or Jehovah's Witness, you better leave the house, okay? <laughs> because the Bible is about God working in us and as Gary said, we are his partners and we take the talents and stuff and there's stuff we got to do too. And so I said to her, I said, 
how long has it been since you've had a date? She said, about three years. I said, Louie, that's pathetic. Why am I judging you? I don't mean that. I mean, the reason why it's pathetic is because you want to. And there's no reason for you not to other than something must be getting in the way. And I want to help you. I said, if you'll let me be your dating coach, I guarantee you, you'll be dating in six months. But you have to do everything I tell you. She goes, fine. <laughs> I can tell it's fine. So I gave her her first assignment. And I said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to every Friday send me five names, five, five names of guys that you email me, five names of guys that you met that week that have had enough of an interaction with you, at least in a conversation, where they could be interested in you. She says, five a week? I haven't had a date in three. I said, I didn't say anything about a date. I just want to know if you can talk to one. <laughs> and besides, I want no recycling old inventory. I want five new names. <laughs> okay? She goes, where am I going to find them? I said, I don't care, 7-Eleven. She said, I'm not going to go out. I said, I didn't say anything about going out. I want to see what happens just when you interact with men. She goes, all right. So she does it first couple of weeks. Third week or so, I get a call about 10 o'clock at night. And it's Lily. She goes, <laughs> panic, <laughs> attack. I can't breathe. I said, oh, my gosh. And she never had to have one I knew of. And so <clears throat> I talked her through the panic attack. And then I said, Lily, what is going on? She said, well, it's Thursday night. I needed one more name. And I'm at this singles gathering at our church, and there's this hot guy over by the book table. And she said, I wanted to, to maybe, I needed to get my other name, but I wanted to meet him, and I went over and I, I started talking to him and asking him if, you know, he was looking at a book and I was going to go, you know, if you read that book, just to start a conversation, at least I got a name. And she said, I started having a panic attack. And I said, what were you thinking? She goes, nothing. I mean, I was just asking him, I said, Lily, what were you thinking? She said, nothing. I said, Lily, you were thinking something. You can't have a panic attack without something going through your head. She goes, I really was, I said, Lily. She goes, okay, you really want to know? I said, yeah. She said, when I started talking to him, all I could think about was how big my butt is right now. <laughs> I said, really? That's what you were thinking about? She said, yeah. I said, well, let's talk about that. <laughs> Not her butt, but let's talk about this issue. I said, how do you feel about your body? And we started talking about that. I said, when did you start to feel bad about your body that you can remember? We started talking about that. And within about 10 or 15 minutes, she was weeping. Her two brothers, older brothers, what had happened to her through them that destroyed her body image. And, you know, as I started to deal with her and help with her and help her get some help and all this. I noticed actually that when she interacted with men, she was a different person before, you know, before she got through this, she would shut down and the light in her eyes was gone and her spontaneity, she just, the anxiety underneath and the body image, it just wasn't hooking anybody, you know, in that good sense of a connection where somebody would follow up or whatever but you know what we put her in a group and she went through um, I wrote a book that deals with a bunch of stuff called Changes That Heal and she started working that and she got a therapist and started working on this body image digging around and fertilizing a year and a half later I got to fly to Orlando and do her wedding now isn't that cool and that's not, seriously, that's not the only time that's happened because God's ways work. But she could have had 
for three years, a bad time. So what I want to call you into today is taking the step. If you're evaluating yourself and down on yourself, get into a place of no condemnation with other people, a mentor, a coach, some friends, where you're accepted and can talk about how you're failing. But secondly, in that menu, bring some people that can help dig around and get to what's underneath that problem and fertilize you and give you whatever you need, the skills and encouragement to get past. Because those three ingredients over time are the ways throughout the Bible that God calls us out of Egypt and into the promised land. And he wins. So I'm going to pray for y'all, all all of us, and then we will have some music and some worship, right? Um, Father, I just want to ask you to come in, in a even more powerful way. Enter into this room and visit us today. God, bring the presence of your spirit here. We invite you to come into this place, God, and to speak to people, to heal people, to break bondages, to deliver people, to give the next step. Father, I pray that words might flow through here, encouragement might flow through here, enlightenment to people would flow through here. And God, point out the places tap on the shoulder if there's some stagnant place that you want to address to bring them to deeper healing. Show them that. And God, also, I pray, if you're trying to show them another person that they are going to be the fertilizer to, that they're going to be the one that the advocate to and equip them to do that. So we ask all these things. And God, we thank you for vintage which is such a vineyard of place, of a place where you work. And I pray for your continued favor and protection and, and just presence in this body. In Jesus' name, amen.